So, Mr. Quinterway, the first question, uh, back in the day when you, when you started out, when you made shivers, mm -hmm. during the process, I, I've understood that it was pretty tough sometimes, you know, and no, not too much money and, and a little bit of self-doubt, nightmares and all that, mm -hmm. that stuff. What made you go on and not, not quit? Uh, ignorance, ignorance, basically. Okay. I mean, it's good to be ignorant and arrogant yeah. when you're a kid, mm -hmm. a filmmaker, um, because... Um, it can be overwhelming. You have to really focus on what you're doing. You know, focus. Start, don't think about the career that you will or will not have, but think, focus very much on what you're doing right at the moment, and mm -hmm. not get distracted by the potential that you think you have or you mm -hmm. haven't. As you have to solve problems every day as a director. I mean, you really, literally, are making one or two thousand decisions a day that no one else can make for you or or would make the same way. So, that really takes a lot of it the energy that you have and the focus that you have. You have mm -hmm. to sort of live for that rather than thinking about what will happen in you know, 10 years from now. Yeah. Mm. So what would you be your, your foremost advice for directors starting out being in the same position as you were? Um, well, of course, things are different now than they were when, when I was making films, and it depends where you are in the world and what language you're making films in and so on. But um, you just have to have uh, as much confidence and tenacity as you can as you can muster. You know, I have to really, it's interesting because as, as any artist, you have to have a very thin skin, you know, you have to be very sensitive to everything. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you have to have a very tough skin because if you, if you, uh, if you are too affected by negative criticism, which you will definitely get no matter what you do, mm -hmm. somebody's going to hate what you do, you know mm -hmm. that. Um, uh, then, then it can, you, it can destroy you. Mm -hmm. So you have to be, a, a weird combination of incredibly tough and incredibly sensitive mm. uh, and delicate, really. Yeah. So uh, how, how do you do, especially in this, <coughs> with starting out, not to take it too personally when you, when you hear that this is impossible to do this? How, what do you think? Well, I often say that I take all criticism personally. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a, your, your, your films are in some way a very personal statement. You, mm -hmm. you get very attached to it. It's like someone attacking your child, you know, if you're attacked. So I, you, you, I do take that personally. I mean, if a critic has said very nasty things about me, I'm not going to be very friendly to that critic. No, of course not. <laughs> but um, in terms of people telling you what's, impo what's possible and what's impossible, you, c you can always get a second opinion, you know. I mm. mean, it's, um, and, you, and you have the models of people who've done that in the past, mm. uh, which is very important. It's very important to have some if not mentors, if it would be great to have a mentor, somebody who actually could help guide you through mm. the process. But if not that, then you have the historical record of, of filmmakers who have mm. managed to uh, achieve great things through tre tremendous adversity, and not, not just financial, but personal adversity as well. Mm. And, and if you move on to the present here, um, The History of Violence is, is one of the few, thing, few films that you did not write yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, how come? Did you feel tired of writing all of a sudden? Or? Well, actually, I've uh, I th I've done quite a few films that I haven't written mm -hmm. myself, starting with The Dead Zone, which is over oh, yeah, 20 years right. ago. Um, and uh, first of all, one of the reasons that you write to begin with is that no one else will give you a script if mm -hmm. you're an unknown director, you've never directed anything before in your life. Mm -hmm. So uh, people like Brian De Palma, for example, a lot of people started off writing their own scripts. Mm -hmm. um, but what happens is that as you go along, the momentum that you have as a filmmaker picks up if you've been successful. And you can no longer take a year off or two years off to write a script, because sometimes it takes that long to write a good script. Mm -hmm. you, you, people hear stories of people writing a script in three days and five days and two weeks and stuff. But usually it takes a lot longer. Mm -hmm. And it's much easier, and it's very tempting, too to uh, start adapting a book or working on a script that already exists that, that somebody's interested in financing than it is to say, okay, now I'm going to stop my career for two years while I write a script, at the end of which I might end up with a script that I don't like, even though it's my own script. Mm. Or it's a script that I like but somehow seems unfinanceable. Mm. Um, so that's why uh, filmmakers who start off writing their own stuff because no one else will give them a script to work mm -hmm. with um, often end up spending much less time writing original material. Mm. And you once said that, I, I read that you make a movie to find out what it is that made you want to make the movie. Mm -hmm. 
So have you yet figured out why you why you made this of violence or why you wanted to? Make I'm getting it? there. I'm getting, getting there. there. Yeah, it's interesting that the interview process becomes part of the filmmaking process. Mm. You know, um, because so I have to sometimes remind journalists and critics that not to confuse their their process with mine, which mm -hmm. is to say they're very interested in analyzing the connections between the themes of the movies or the imagery from one film and the other film. But that's not where the movie comes from for me. I, when I'm making a movie, I try to forget all, all my other movies. I try mm -hmm. to forget what people expect from me or don't expect from me mm -hmm. and focus just on the film itself because each movie is kind of a little unique universe of its own with its own ecosystem. And you have to pay attention to that and, and not impose on it ideas of what you are, for example. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have to forget what you are or what people think you are and just let the movie talk to you mm -hmm. and tell you what it wants and then you give it what it wants. Mm -hmm. So, um, have I answered the question? I don't know. Well, I guess so. We're on our way here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and obviously, violence is a reoccurring theme in your films. Uh, do you have any idea why people are so attracted to violence, even though they don't want to be a part of it mm -hmm. themselves? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I think as we try to civilize ourselves from the very violent species that we really are, mm -hmm. Um, we still have these impulses to things that we now feel are, cannot work with a civilized society. Uh, in the Freudian formula, civilization is repression. You know, that you can't have civilization unless you can repress many things that we are. Amongst them would be our propensity for violence and for dealing with things in a violent way. Uh, but we still have the impulse. So feeling that means that we're, we're intrigued by these impulses within ourselves that we're encouraged by society to repress. Mm -hmm. And there's some way that we need to express them or deal with them or consider them and, and doing it in, let's say, movies or art or any kind of art form mm -hmm. or even in the form of certain kinds of religions and rituals and stuff. There are ways that you can express these forbidden things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's one of the reasons that violence is fascinating because mm -hmm. we are attracted to it and repelled by it at the same time. Mm. It's a strange schizophrenia. Oh, it is, yeah. yeah. And, and the humor also seems to be a, a certain <coughs> element of, of your films. Do uh, you think we'll ever see a, like a conventional comedy made by David Cronenberg? Well, I mean, in some ways, Naked Lunch is a comedy, you know. Mm. Um, uh, I think all my films are funny. Mm. Uh, they, they, they don't... I don't think I want to make a conventional comedy because I'm not that interested in making any kind of conventional film in the sense of it being very predictable and f following a very rigid uh, template, you know, form. Because that, I find that, <clears throat> that that's very anti-creative um, and it's, very, it's not very interesting, it's no. not very exciting. Yeah. Excuse me. <coughs> Um, but uh, for me, humor is, you know, it's a, it's a sort of a survival mechanism, I think, for human beings in general. <clears throat> and um, as a result, I, I, that's why it probably ends up in all my movies, because mm -hmm. it, it, there's a sense in which every movie should be a bit like a day in a life of somebody. That is to say, not one tone, you know, not a movie that's all sad or all happy. Mm. But but uh, like the kind of roller coaster that we we have emotionally during the course of even just a no normal day, things are tragic, then they're repulsive, and then they're exhilarating, and then they're mm. funny, and then they're joyous. You know, all of those things. So humor is obviously a part of that. Mm. I can't imagine making a movie with no humor. No, no, no. And if you look at a uh, history of violence compared to your your previous work, what would you say is is the biggest difference? Um, I I wouldn't normally analyze my own movie. No, I understand. Uh, it, it's just because uh, it, it suggests to people that that's how you created it, you know. Mm -hmm. But when really so much that you do in making a movie is intuitive. Mm -hmm. um, it's a nervous system thing. Mm -hmm. It's not really an analyze. I don't even do storyboards or anything like that. Every mm -hmm. day is just kind of a, you're, you're finding the film, you're discovering what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot has been made of, of uh, the idea that history of violence is, is a um, is a sort of a more mainstream movie than than I normally do. But you think of the Dead Zone that was over twenty years ago. It was mm -hmm. based on a Stephen King bestselling mm -hmm. novel, which is very mainstream. Mm -hmm. And um, so, to me, this is not. It's just 
it's just by accident really it's not a turning point or it's not an indicator of where I'm going or anything it just so happens that this movie seems to feel to people more accessible than some of my other movies and I think the main reason for that is that the characters are more familiar you know I'm normally interested in characters who are marginal mm -hmm. uh, outsiders eccentrics mm -hmm. obsessives um, and then my job then is to kind of seduce the audience into those films and bring them closer to those difficult characters so that by the end of the movie the audience might have some empathy for those characters that they f at first thought they didn't want to know anything about. In this movie you start with a very familiar uh, easy to look at family, attractive and sort of as they say more accessible, more normal. But then I take them and the audience on a kind of strange difficult journey that maybe they didn't expect to go on. So it's kind of an inside out version of what I normally do. And I think that's why people have thought it's uh, more accessible, let's say, mm. more mainstream. Mm. And if you look uh, at the tremendous amount of work that, that you have behind you, and now you're here uh, receiving the Stockholm Lifetime Achievement mm. Award, uh, why, do you think, why do you think you were chosen for mm. the award? Uh, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I think it's, it's difficult these days um, for filmmakers to, to uh, amass a body of work that mm. seems to be coherent. Uh, mm. Uh, things are very spotty, you know, people do a little TV and then they do one movie that's successful and then they do an obscure mu movie mm. and then they sort of disappear for a while. In the old days of the art film with a capital A, the, the films of Bergman and Fellini and Truffaut mm. and so on, they, these guys would, they would do 20, 30 films that, that we all had their own personal voice and personal touch. Mm. It seems to be a lot harder to do that these days mm. and um, and so I think the number of filmmakers who have reached a point where they have this voice that is recognizable mm. is uh, it's, it's, it's limited so maybe I yeah then maybe that's why because you obviously you're always straight staying true to your own cause and not really when mainstream so I, I suppose it's it's a you know it's an easy easy way out for people but also you lose track yeah. of what you want to do maybe that's also one of the reasons well it could be I mean um, it's for me it's a very personal thing filmmaking and mm. uh, uh, it's not sort of just an industrial thing or just it's, it's a, a lot of young filmmakers now don't aspire to be Fellini or Bergman they just mm. they aspire to be hot directors you mm. know it's, just the, the, it's being the director that is attracted to, the, to them is attractive to them rather than having something to say or having using film as a way to uh, uh, deal with life or analyze life mm. um, they just they don't care what they direct mm. as long as they're hot directors yeah. and that's uh, that will lead to different kind of work. Mm. Talking about hot directors, uh, is there any director whose work you are planning to see here on the festival or you're interested in mm. seeing? Well there are um, any number of filmmakers whose work I'm interested in and, and who are represented here but the irony is that when you come to a film festival with a film of your own to show, mm. you have no time to see anybody else's film no, because you're doing <laughs> interviews like this, yeah. which is what you're here for, partly. Mm. But so that, that for a filmmaker, uh, a festival is probably the worst place to see movies, okay. especially, I mean, imp when you have a film in yeah. the festival. Um, it's, it's, it's really frustrating. What happens is I end up having to catch up to, with these movies years later, mm. often. The films that I've heard about at a festival, and for example, we. We first premiered uh, History of Violence uh, at Cannes last mm, May. Yeah. I saw not one other film there. It was just wall-to-wall -wall interviews mm. and stuff. So you're, you're basically launching your movie, so yeah. it takes a lot of energy. energy. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Cronenberg, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.